Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Jonathan Rumer from KPMG Tech Growth. Uh, and he's going to give us some insights on pitching your business. So without any further ado, over to you, John. Great. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, not just to have the opportunity and the honor to speak at such a fantastic conference, one that's growing every year, but also this is very much a homecoming for me. And you may, you may not be able to hear it, but I have a lot of Welsh ancestry. Um, so, in fact, my great-great-great-grandfather was the rabbi of a town called Merthyr Tydfil, which I'm sure some of you may know. Um, and, in fact, I've got a whole bunch of, of ancestors who are actually buried there and, and around Wales. And perhaps later today I might, might go visit them. Um, but enough about the past, because today we're going to look at the future and, and how you actually get there. And today you are going to see something amazing, or you're going to hear something amazing. You're going to hear a consultant give a straight answer. In fact, you're going to hear a consultant give six straight answers. Um, that consultant is me, um, despite what clapping you hear next door. And those of you who've had the pleasure to deal with consultants will know that getting a straight answer is as difficult as stealing candy from a baby. And I rightfully do see a bit of um, amusement in, the, in your faces in the audience. And, but I can assure you, as a parent of two young children, that taking anything away from a child, let alone something sweet, is incredibly difficult to do. My talk today is based around a very famous book. It's um, a book that really is at the heart of entrepreneurialism. Um, it's really famous. You'll absolutely recognize the author and the, and the book when I show you the next slide. Um, it's one of the few business books that was actually featured by Oprah on her, uh, on her book show. And that book is obviously Dr. Seuss, Other Places You'll Go. Um, it really is an amazing book, not just for children, but for absolutely anybody in any stage of life who's looking to move forward and do something different. That's me. That picture's about five years old. Hopefully, I haven't aged too badly um, from when I first joined KPMG. So just a little bit about me and uh, what I do at KPMG. So, after school and throughout university and after university, I dabbled in the world of entrepreneurialism and I had a few startups, everything from biometric um, fraud prevention in the healthcare industry through to mobile marketing and mobile adverts on, on cell phones about seven or eight years ago. Most of my ventures were almost successful, as I used to, usually like to say, and did have some success with one of my mobile businesses, which uh, the investor bought me out when I came across the UK. After my journey through startups, I spent quite a bit of time in academia. I qualified as an actuary and went on to get an MBA at Imperial College. And over the last seven or eight years, I've been in the corporate world working from big banks to life insurance companies and over the last couple of years at the High Growth Technology Group in KPMG. Our team works with startups. We base in Shoreditch and have outreach across the country. And we really are here to help small and fast growth companies get there even quicker. Now, last night, when I was preparing for this, I was speaking to all the various family and trying to you know, get last-minute tips and advice, and my mom sent me a, a YouTube link to somebody who taught you how to do good body language when you're speaking. So everyone was being really encouraging. And then I spoke to, to my, my, my Uncle A.B. Now, Uncle A.B. is really your quintessential old Jewish man. And he said something that actually just disturbed me last night. He said, you know, I haven't spoken to, to my wife, Auntie Sarah, for, for quite a few years now. Um, now, this was actually really strange. They've been married for like 45 years and seemingly have a, an absolutely perfect life. And I said to him, Uncle Abby, what's going on? Is there something wrong that you're not speaking to, to, to Auntie Sarah? And he said, no, I just didn't want to interrupt her. So today is like that. Today I'm probably doing most of the speaking towards the beginning part of this talk, but this is just the beginning of the conversation. This is not a one-way thing. I would like to find out from each and every one of you why you're here today, what you are looking to do, and potentially how we can help. Please tweet me, tweet the team. I'm the only Jonathan Rumor on LinkedIn, so there should be no excuses for, for not being able to find me. Entrepreneurs change the world. Small businesses and growing businesses are absolutely the backbone of this economy and the backbone of any growing economy in the world. When you decide to take that journey, to say, I want to do something more, I want to be better. It is an absolutely incredible point in time. It's a time when you have a blank piece of paper, when you have unlimited opportunity, plenty of passion, and no shortage of options. The question really is, where do you begin? How do you get going? 
And the first thing that we're going to have a brief look through today is, is idea generation. So we're going to run through the whole journey from idea to exit, and we are going to focus on funding options today, which we'll get to a bit later. And when we understand those funding options a bit better, you'll be able to pitch your business better because you understand the mechanisms of that funding source and what those investors are actually looking for. But before you go raising money, you need an idea, you need an opportunity, you need a product. And there are two general ways that you can come by these ideas. One is active and one is passive. Passive is Newton's apple, it hits you on the head, or it's often born out of frustration where you happen to be standing on a street corner in the rain, desperate for a taxi and there are none. And you said, wouldn't it be great if I could push a button on my phone and a taxi would come to me? Those are passive ideas. Um, they are rare, most of them probably aren't great, but they do happen. You also have active ideas, or active idea generation, opportunity identification. And there are two types of active idea generation. One is called tech push, and one is called demand pull. And what they are really is defined by, or the keys are in the name. Tech push is where you begin with a technology. These are your classic inventions, your mad scientists, your, your academics. You start with a technology, you try and find something that you can do with it. You market it, you put it on the road, you, you get people selling it, and then you try and figure out, well, do people actually want it, do people actually need it? The other thing on the other end of the spectrum is something called demand pull. This starts by going around and saying to people, can you tell, some, tell me something that bugs you? What are your problems? How can I solve them? Once you've identified what problems there are, you then work backwards. You do your marketing, your development concurrently, and you end up with a product that then has a market need, or you know that actually there's a market need for it. Just quickly in the room, I know this is the, uh, the post-lunch um, session, which is, which is always very difficult, but a little bit of exercise just to raise your hands. Who thinks tech push is the better way to come up with ideas? Okay, one, two, three, not too many, not too many. Demand pull? All right, great. Um, and th those of you who are saying demand pull is definitely in the majority at the moment. And it fits very much with the whole lean startup approach and things that we'll look at soon. Um, there is, however, a few caveats to that because demand pull is often responsible for incremental change. So you know that there's an existing problem and when you ask people about what they want solved, they'll tell you. Technology push is responsible often for the big leaps, the big leaps forward. Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said, faster, horses. So customers don't always know what they want. Sometimes a new technology comes along that revolutionizes what's going on, and people do need to be educated about it. So while demand pull is probably easier for most startups to get into, especially when you're a non-technical founder, technology push really is responsible for the biggest jumps forward. And the best and most successful um, businesses and opportunities are where you can merge both, where you can find a brilliant new technology and match it to, to the market. Once you've got your idea, it really is now about getting building. There's, you need to do some analysis, so you spend some time on Google figuring out, well, are people doing what I'm doing? Yes, no. Um, in fact, if you find nobody doing what you're doing, that's a much bigger warning sign than if you do find people doing what you're doing. When I sit with people, and I have hundreds of startups who come to us over the years, and, um, and tell us, and they all say, yeah, I'm the only one in the world doing this. And if they say they're the only one in the world doing it, it means one of a few things. One, it means they probably haven't done their research, because there are probably a whole lot of other people who have done it. And the other option is that, well, a lot of people have tried it, but they failed, and there's probably good reasons why they failed. Either the market wasn't there, the technology wasn't there. Um, there is a reason why nobody's doing what you're doing. There are very few businesses who can absolutely say, we're the only people doing this. I know one or two, but it is most definitely the exception. There are a lot of resources out there to help you get building, and I like to call it the Goldilocks principle, and we'll move away from Dr. Seuss and move, move towards Goldilocks, and that's all, that's all about a little bit too hot, a little bit too cold, or a little bit too big, a little bit too, too small, until you find that right one. The Lean Startup, also known as the Goldilocks principle, is all about testing and getting feedback and actually understanding what your market wants. So you start with your minimal viable product, which is the smallest working version that proves to be valuable what you're doing. And then you put it out there and you ask people to give you their feedback. This really is a fantastic way of, of building businesses today. Not only because you make sure that your product actually has a need, but because you will actually find out if there is no need for your product very quickly, so you'll be able to fail fast. 
So instead of spending two years building out a full functional product, you could spend six months building out something smaller and find out there's no market for it, close the business after six months, and then move on to the next thing instead of wasting another 18 months. It really, really is so important to get out and speak to people. Do not worry about people stealing your ideas. If you, ha if you have a trust issue with a particular business or person, don't speak to them. But there are so many people out there that you can speak to. And if you want to sign people to sign NDAs, fine. Easy, easily enough to take a standard NDA. People ask us, in my experience, when people ask me to sign an NDA, it's generally a sign that this is their first business, that they haven't ever done this before. Because when people have run successful businesses before, they realize that you cannot get anywhere without speaking to people. Again, use your judgment, but speak to people. Um, up on stage, there's a few resources, things to help with where you can actually come up with ideas and where you can actually do things. And in terms of getting building, it can be very difficult if, you're not, if you are not technical. Um, there's some really great resources out there. And one of the things you may notice on the slide is that I work for a pretty big organization at the moment who has a very big risk department, and they kind of asked me to make a little note on the slide. So you may be able to spot the fact that KPMG has, has quite a conservative risk, risk department. Um, just to draw out one of them, there's a company called Marvel. What it lets you do is to draw your app on pieces of paper with the buttons and everything you want, and you take pictures of it, and then it turns it into, into a working demo app on your phone. So it lets you take those drawn buttons and make them into real buttons, so that you can actually so show somebody the wireframes and things of what you're actually trying to do. Great resource. As far as I know, it's free or, or a really small monthly fee, those types of things. So there's lots of really great resources out there that help you get building. Um, if you want more information on these types of things, just you know, tweet me, and I'm more than happy to speak to you about it afterwards. This is something that's really, really important and close to my heart, and this is false barriers. When you're getting going, and when your business is in the early stages, you really are competing against yourself. You are your worst nightmare, you are your own worst enemy, and at the same time, you are your biggest strength. When you're getting going, especially when you're going for your demo product or your first launch, you have these list of things that you, you put down as requirements. If I just need this partnership, we need to get this revenue, we need to get that investor or this amount of users. Most of those things will be false barriers. They will not be true. My brother and I were working on a venture a while back in the social entrepreneurial space. It was a business that would let you um, see where uh, restaurants around you had coupons, and the whole theory behind it is the one, one for one like Tom's and Warby Parker. So every time you use the coupon, a donation would be made to a charity, um, enough to feed a starving child somewhere in the world. And that donation could be anywhere from seven to 10 or 12 P. It's not a, not a very big amount to actually show you how much that, but that's a talk for, a, for another day. Um, and when we were trying to get our MVP going, we said one of the things we absolutely had to have was a charity partner. We had to have that charity on board, somebody who we could actually say, the, charity, the money goes to them, they'll put up their hand and say, yeah, this, this is great. That was a false barrier, and that cost us a lot of time, you know, plumbing our network to get those, those, those contacts and trying to draw up contracts and all these things. That was a complete false barrier. There was nothing stopping us from running the product and just handing a check to the charity at the end of the month and saying, by the way, the money went to that charity. That was a false barrier. Anytime you hear the words, we just, or if only, your mind should absolutely be attuned to that and say, do you really? Do you really need those things? We're going to look at funding options now and all the different various ways and means of getting there. And at each option, we'll try and look at how the motives of those investors are different and therefore how you should pitch to them is different. And oh, there we go. Um, on the screen, there is a whole bunch of the different findings. There shouldn't be anything there that's too surprising. Everything from angels to crowds to accelerators, VCs, etc. And we're going to run through each of them now. But as all good consultants say, let's take a step back for a second. Um, before you go to speak to any investors and before you get anywhere in this journey, there are a few things that you, you need to know. And there's a few things that I, I get asked frequently. And on this next slide, you will indeed get those Six straightforward answers. Do, you need a, do I need a business plan? Yes. Do I need a financial forecast? Yes. Can I send you templates? No. Um, what goes into the pitch document? Team, product, market, and traction. Um, what is the value of my company? Great question. Um, it really is. Is it too early to start speaking to investors? Never. And latte or flat white latte. I'm just kind of old-fashioned that way. Um, 
these are really, really key questions. And if we just start right at the beginning, the, about a business plan. When you're meeting with investors and they want to see your business plan, what is it for? So a business plan is not a Google list, list of directions of how you're going to get from where you are to exit. What the investor sees in your business plan is your ability to articulate your business, your product, and your market. To see that you know what you're talking about. They want to know that you're able to identify your own strengths and weaknesses, and that you're able to understand what opportunities and threats there are in the industry, in the market. They want to know that you've identified your competitors and that you understand why you are better than them or why you are cheaper than them or why you are the same but you have better access to the market than they do. So it doesn't really matter if you say, you know, in month one we're going to do this, in month two we're going to do this. It's about seeing your understanding of, of your own market. And similarly with the financial model is that in your financial model, the numbers are actually irrelevant. They don't matter. They're never going to be right at all, especially towards the, the beginning of a business. So people often say to me, well, why, why do I need one then if it's all rubbish anyway? And again, it's not about the numbers, it's about the process. If you have a good financial model, it will show what the drivers of revenue are and the drivers of the cost. It will show that you understand your business. If you're running a SaaS business and you leave out you know, costs related to, to running servers and things and paying for server time and stuff, that's not really a great you know, reflection on you. And when it comes to something like marketing, I don't care if you've got 1,000 pounds in there a month or 10,000 pounds a month. What I care about and what investors care about is can you justify what you put that in for? Why did you go with 1,000? Why did you go with 10,000? You said you're going to use it for Facebook and Twitter. Do you know what the conversion rates are going to be and how is that then going to affect your user growth or your revenue growth? So it's about being able to justify the numbers in there. That said, there are a few things you should probably do in your financial model. Make sure everything sums up. Excel is really tricky, but make sure it, it, it works. Um, also, if you're a founder and you need a salary to, and that's going to be part of your, your, um, your uh, fundraising, that's okay, but keep it reasonable. I had a founder who put in an 80,000 pound salary in year one. Um, he, yeah, I gave him a bit of feedback that might not be the best idea. Um, he never got back to me and I don't think he raised the money. But um, just be reasonable with those things. Everybody understands that everyone needs to earn a living. And, and often if you, you put your salary but you link it towards performance and you start low and say it'll, it'll ratchet up as you do better, then you know what, nobody can argue with that. Is it too early to speak to investors? No. Now, that's not to say if you've just got an idea, you should go knock on Index Ventures or Balderton's door and say, listen, um, will, you, will you invest? But what you should do is you, could you should go start speaking to people and saying, this is what I'm working on. In three to six months' time, I will be raising money. Can you tell me what you would like to see from me in three or six months' time that would make it likely for you to invest in my business? It's really simple. People will tell you. They will want you to do that. They'll want you to hit those KPIs, and then it makes you an attractive investment. It's kind of like being back in school and being given the exam three months before you need to write it. It's a really, really simple thing to do, um, but not a lot of people do it. And again, yeah, I just prefer a latte to flat white. Um, so tonight in the US will be one of those big events in about three and a half hours' time. Tim Cook will take the stage at Apple for the beginning of the Worldwide Developers Conference to that magic stage, which, to be honest, is a personal dream that one day I'll be standing on there wearing a black turtleneck and channeling Steve and going to utter those absolute magic words one more time. Now, I will say those words now today. Thank you. Um, but unfortunately, it's not for the new iPhone 7. It's for something else that's really, really, really important. And that is SEIS and EIS. Um, the Enterprise Investment Scheme and then the seed version of that, which is kind of the baby brother. Now, this is a really great government scheme that helps investors invest in early stage businesses. And by making it less risky to invest in your businesses, it means you're going to have a much greater chance to raise money. Very simply, if an investor, a private investor, puts 100,000 pounds into your business um, under SEIS, they will get 50% of that back through their income tax. So they have effectively only put in 50,000. So they de-risk by half. There's lots of other benefits for it. Businesses can raise un up to 150,000 pounds um, in total under SEIS and 5 million per year under EIS, which is absolutely fantastic as well. Uh, the other big benefit is that when the business does very well and exit, inv investors exit, if they've held the shares for three years, they don't pay capital gains. So it is an absolutely fantastic thing. 
Um, it takes about four to six weeks to get advanced assurance from HMRC, so as long as you're more than four to six weeks away from fundraising, you should um, do the application. It's about sending your business plans and telling HMRC what you're doing. And as always, there's terms and conditions apply, but uh, most young businesses should qualify without too much hassle, unless you're in the fintech space and, or asset-backed businesses, which are a little bit more tricky. Um, bootstrapping and friends and family. So bootstrapping is not really a way to fund a business, um, in theory, but it is a great way to start any business. And one of the things that you're going to come across when looking at any types of funding at any stage of a business is a balance between valuation and time to market, or dilution and time to market. The more you do, the more users you have, the more revenue you have, the more awards you win, the more traction you've got, the higher your valuation. Um, so the more you can do before going for money, the higher your valuation, the less you dilute. You have a, a bigger piece of a bigger pie. On the other side, if you take in money, it generally speeds up the process. You can hire extra developers, you can do more marketing, you can get into the market quicker, um, which should then hopefully push your valuation up quicker, but you'll obviously have a smaller piece of the pie. So whenever you're raising money, you have to look at that balance and say, you know, is it worth it for me slogging it out for another six months and retaining a bigger piece, or do I have to actually get to market within three months and have a smaller piece of the pie, and hopefully the pie will be so much bigger because I got there quicker? There is no right answer to that. It is a very difficult thing to decide, but you need to understand both consequences, and then you can make the decision for yourself. Frugal founders make happy investors. So that's not to say that if you've proven yourself to be a, you know, a tight ass or, or really cheap, that's what investors are going to want. They want to know that when you spend their money, you're spending it wisely. You're spending it on things that add the most value, like a great accountant. Um, we're an accounting firm. Come on, please. Um, also, if you can do a lot bootstrapping, if you can show the traction that you can gain on your own, then you can say to the investors, look what I've done on my own, imagine what I can do with, with more resource behind me. It's about strapping a rocket on. It's not about, all right, we can go from A to B. It's about going from A to F immediately, jumping a whole bunch of steps. Bootstrapping can be, technic can be difficult for non-technical founders, but there are a lot of resources, some that I mentioned earlier and some more that will come up just now. Um, and the more you can do, the better. Often the first funding that a lot of companies will get is from friends and families, and a lot of people call it friends, families, and fools, but to be honest, I think if somebody's prepared to give you their money, you should never ever call them a fool, no matter whether the fact that they are. I think that anybody who ever gives their money needs to be treated with the utmost respect. So when you get money from friends and family, there's a few things that need to be considered. Now, firstly, mostly, and you'd hope that these people actually have your best interests at heart. So the negotiation shouldn't be too tough. Um, the terms should be pretty flexible, and in fact, there probably won't be any terms, which, which is definitely a problem. Um, the money can probably come in a lot quicker and be a lot more flexible. But there are a couple of downsides that you have to consider, and one of them is around affordability. You know, if, you're, if your Auntie Jane has got a 10,000 pound pension and she's 55, she probably cannot afford to give you 5,000 pounds. Most early businesses will fail, and even beyond that, those that succeeded will take several years before there is you know, any liquidity or exit events for, for anybody to get their money back. So you have to absolutely consider that any money that you take from somebody will be lost. And then if it isn't, you know, it's a, it is a bonus. And if the business fails, you know, these are people you still have to spend a lot of time with in many years to come. Can you actually face them? Now, it is a tough one because if you go to a VC and say, or, or an angel investor and say, you know, I haven't taken any money from friends and family, but I want money from you, they may say to you, well, you know, if you're not prepared to take money from them, if you don't trust, if they're not prepared to trust you, why should I trust you? But you know what, life, life is difficult, so you've got to have your answers prepared for that. If you do go down this route, you do need to formalize it. You must sign contracts, you must sign shareholders' agreements. It will go a long way to preventing issues later on. No matter how much you, know, you love your dad and your brother and your sister and your aunt, keep it formal. Let everybody know where they stand. And that could be between a loan or equity, and sometimes a loan might be preferable in this case, so that you get your money, and then as soon as you get more investment in, you get more professional money in, you can repay your family. Now, that'll mean they don't have any upside in the business, but at least they get their money back. So it's definitely something that needs to be considered. Angel investing is, without a doubt, the most common form of investing for early stage businesses, and one that I'll focus on a little bit more now. There are about 18,000 angel investors in, in the country, in the UK, investing somewhere around a billion pounds a year. That's two and a half times more money that gets invested in, through angels than through VCs, um, and it's a lot, a lot more granular. Now, 
the average angel will probably invest somewhere between 10 and 250,000 pounds, um, but you do get some angels who I've seen write million pound checks, but they are slightly less common. Um, angel syndicates do often work together and then will invest up to, up to a million pounds. Now, it's very important to know that angels are not all created equal. When you are taking angel investment on, it is coming from an individual, from a person, as opposed to a VC, which is, we'll discuss later. So their motives are going to be very different. This is their money they're investing. They're not investing here to get a carry or fees. They're investing because they believe in you. And at the early stage of the business, that's what it's all about. It's going to be about the team. The most important part is the team, is the founders and the people behind it. So when you're pitching to an angel, you need to focus on yourself, and your partners, and who are the people involved. Now, an average, an average idea with a fantastic team will work, but a fantastic idea with an average team will, will highly likely fail. It's all about the team, so you want to show what you've done. And that if you've got a successful exit, great, that makes life easier. But you know what, it doesn't have to be that. It can be anything to show the fact that you are the right person. You need to show the passion, and you need to sell yourself, because ultimately that's what the angel is investing in. And at the same time, while you're busy selling yourself to them, you need to make sure that they are the right people. Do not grab the first money that gets thrown at you. And it might be the best deal, but you need to value, evaluate it properly. Um, and I say that from personal experience. When my first business that raised money, raised money from an, from an angel, and it was one of the first investments he had done. We celebrated that night that we, we finally got somebody who, you know, we managed to convince to give us money. Um, and he celebrated he'd made his you know, first investment, uh, but at the same time, neither of us knew what we were doing. And if, when I look back on the terms, he gave us what was about a million rand at the time of several years ago in South Africa, which is only equivalent to probably 50,000 pounds at the moment now, um, for 60% of the business, and it was a loan, which had to be repaid. So he was un under the understanding that he had to have control of the business because he was putting in the money. We didn't care about the terms because, hey, somebody was prepared to give us money and we were 21 or 22 and, you know, what could go wrong? Um, the business did do, did do well at the beginning, but that shareholding did cause serious, serious issues, um, which played out much later on. So when you take angel investment, you need to be sure of the terms and you need to be sure that the angel understands the terms and why it doesn't make sense for them to have a majority of the business. It really doesn't. And you will see that as soon as somebody gives you problems about the terms and they really are asking for onerous things, it probably is because they aren't relatively new to angel investing. Um, beyond the money, it's very important that the person who you choose to partner with can offer more than, just, um, more than just the money. It's very important that they can bring something like their, their network, further funds coming on, or access to clients, because ultimately you need a lot more than money in the beginning. Crowdfunding, for those of you in the room this morning, there was um, Kieran, who I know quite well from Crowdcube, was here, and they spoke about crowdfunding. Um, I'm a big fan of crowdfunding. I think it's absolutely fantastic for the appropriate businesses. Um, three types of crowdfunding in general, equity, donation, reward. So equity, you're selling part of your business. Donation, if you can get it, people's giving you money for nothing. And um, reward, where, which is very big on Kickstarter, where you, you're basically pre-selling a product, or you're going to send them a, a really nice smiley face hat. Crowdfunding takes a lot of effort. This is not one of those things where you put it online and hope it goes viral. Um, doesn't really happen. You need to put a big effort into it, you need to work hard at it, and you need to make sure that you have 10 or 20 or 30 or 40% of that investment beforehand, before it goes on the platform. Companies that have to reach 40 or 40, 40 or 50% of the investment almost always go on to raise the full amount. So you have to make sure that you can get that first amount in. One of the other benefits is is that you do get market engagement, you can get a whole community of people who actually believe in your product. Um, accelerators. Accelerators aren't really a source of fun funding, but um, you they do provide some funding in the beginning, um, but ultimately they can also give you quite a bit of um, access to investors at the end. They are very much the flavor of the month at the moment. There's between 30 and 40, I think, in London alone, um, with new accelerators springing up every day. I get asked a lot, should I join an accelerator? Um, and this is my, my turn to go all black belt consultant and say, all right, my turn to ask the questions. If you're thinking about joining a program, a few questions you need to ask, you, ask yourself. Do you know what the program offers? Um, it could be several things. Some programs are great at mentoring. Others are great at helping you build your tech. Others are great at finding the product market fit. Understand what the program offers. What are they good for? Number two, what do you need? So you might not need the mentoring that that program's great, or you may, you may or may not need it. If what the program offers is what you need, then the third question is, are you prepared to work for it? 
as with anything else, if you're not prepared to sit there for that three months and actually work towards that, don't waste your time. It'll absolutely destroy the business. And the fourth one's quite important because there's a lot of accelerators out there who work in different areas. Um, some are corporate accelerators, the likes of Microsoft, Cisco, and Telefonica all have their own programs. Others are professional accelerators, the likes of Techstars and Startup Bootcamp. Um, and then there's also government ones. Understand what's in it for them and then make sure that fits with yours. So if it's a corporate one who are taking equity in your business and you're actually trying to sell to that wider industry, maybe that's not the best idea because if you're working with Telefonica, then maybe the other companies aren't going to want to invest in you or actually use your product. So understand who they are and what, what they get out of it. VCs are often seen as the holy grail and really, you know, this is it, I've made it, I've got VC funding. And in a lot of ways, getting VC funded is a really great sign for your business. It shows that you're a high growth opportunity with potential to really do well. Before you pitch to a VC, there's a few things that you kind of need to know. And one of them is actually going really down to the basics. What is a VC? How do they structure it? So a venture capital firm will have general partners and limited partners in a fund. The general partners are the people who make all the decisions and choose who to invest in, while the limited partners are the people who actually give the money. So those will be high net worth individuals, pension funds, whoever else it is. They give the money, the general partners actually make the decisions. The way that they are remunerated is through fees. They get a 2% fee and usually a carry at the end. And because of the structure, they can only invest in companies who will do really, really well. So if you've got a business that might just do okay or grow, you know, be a five or 10 person business, you're not a VC company. Even though it'll be an amazing business and you can become a multi-millionaire from it, it's not a VC business. VCs will push for exits because their fund lifetime is structured. They have to be exited within a certain amount of time, so they will push you for an exit. Again, if that's something that you're looking for within three to five years' time, you want to get out of your business, great. Um, when you're speaking to VCs and pitching to VCs, just a few tips. Warm intros are better. If you send them cold emails, chances of them replying to you, practically zero. There are a lot of ways of getting those warm intros. People like KPMG know a lot of people, come through us. But one of the best ways to do it is through the portfolio companies. The VCs will list all their portfolio companies on their websites, go for coffee with the founders. They'll be happy to speak to you and tell you about their experiences with that VC. And then you can say, all right, you know, that sounds like a really great thing. Would you be able to make an intro? And there you go, much, much easier. Um, don't speak to all the VCs. There's not that many across the country and there's even fewer who are active. If you speak to all of them, and this goes along with the last point about being open and honest, is they know each other and they speak to each other. They often co-invest. So if one of the VCs says to you, all right, you know, are you meeting anyone else? And you say no, and then he finds out you are, you're not going to get the investment. And if you, you, know, you, oh, yeah, you say, yeah, I just made Bolton last week, you know, they, they're going to give me a term sheet today, and they're not, again, you'll absolutely sh shoot yourself in the foot. It's a small community. When you're dealing with VCs, it's more about growth than development. So angel investment and crowdfunding will be more about developing your product. VC is more about expansion and growth. So if you are trying to build your first version of the product, there's no point in speaking to a VC. And if you take VC money, it's probably bad for the company. The last two types of funding, very briefly, um, banks and debt, and then grants. Um, I had a picture of Grant Mitchell there for, for grants, because uh, one of my, my colleagues suggested that everyone in this country would know who Grant Mitchell is, but my brand team took it out and replaced it with what probably is supposed to be a government building of some sort. Um, banks and loans, very difficult to get any sort of loan in the early stages. You need to have cash flow and trading history to get loans, um, practically impossible to get from a bank. That said, there is a whole huge market of P2B, which is, which is growing and is incredible. Grants can be difficult to get, a lot of admin, but if you do get grants, it's a fantastic thing to do because there's potentially no strings attached and you, there's no dilution. But lots of admin and often easier to get somebody to help you along the way. He has a whole bunch of resources. Um, don't worry, it's only going to be up shortly, but if you tweet me again, happy to, to send it. It's a whole bunch of accelerators and VCs and things that are, that are out there. And when you actually get to that next stage, there are going to be a lot of challenges. And one of those biggest challenges will be people. And there are lots of ways to incentivize people. And one of those is something called an EMI scheme, um, which lets you give options to your staff. And if you'd like to know more about that, let me know afterwards. When you reach the end, exit. Exit is the destination that we all set out to get. Um, I'm not going to talk about exit, because exit is the destination. And being an entrepreneur and running your business is about the journey. It's about the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs and the knocks and the celebrations along the way. So when, I, when you get to the exit and when you are famous, that's brilliant. And you know what? You're just going to start all over again and you're going to start in your next journey. And the only thing I have left to say is 
You know, find, find your mountain and um, get on your way. Thank you.